Welcome to Mountain View Online. We're glad that you've joined us this morning. And uh, this first song just reminds us of God's faithfulness and uh, even reminds us that he has already displayed his faithfulness to keep his promises uh, through sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And so just want to keep that in mind this morning as we sing together. everybody. Thanks for joining us this morning for online worship. It's great to have you. Uh, I just want to say welcome, and especially if you are new to Mountain View Community Church, thanks so much for joining us today. 
Uh, we'd love to be able to connect with you, and I would like to invite you to go to our website at mvccfrederick.com. There you'll find a tab that says, I'm new. And if you'll click on that tab and fill out that information, we'd love to be able to send you some information about our church and even a welcome gift as well. So thanks for joining us. And I also wanna say thank you to those of you who continue to give sacrificially and generously to the work of the gospel here at Mountain View Community Church. You know, there's so many things we've been able to accomplish during this season because of your generous and ongoing giving. We've been able to bless our community with food boxes all over the county. We're able to continue to pay our bills and to pay our staff. We've been able to do some important work on the facility here to prepare for when we are actually able to relaunch, all because of your generous ongoing giving. So thank you to the Lord for his provision and for your giving. So if you would like to give, would you please do so by going to the website where you will find a tab there. You can just click on the give tab or you can text the word give to the number on the screen. Or finally, you could simply mail in a check to the church office at the address shown on the screen. So Pastor Guy is gonna continue the series called All Things Good Today. And uh, what a very fitting passage that he's looking at in Romans chapter eight. So I hope that you'll tune in and enjoy that. And then I want to invite you to please continue watching through the very end as we hear a very special announcement from Pastor Adam. This is something that you're not gonna to wanna to miss, so please stay tuned to the very end. Thank you. So what I wanna know from you guys today is this. Have you ever gone through a really hard time? a challenging time in your life, and you hated it. Maybe it was like a Dear John letter or something like that. But then later, six months later, a year later, and if you're old, maybe 10 years, 20 years later, you looked back and you said, you know what? That was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It could have been as simple as having to train for that half marathon. It could have been going through college and writing those papers and taking those finals. It could be anything like that. It could be that you got cut from your sports team. You never thought you would get cut. It was the end of your world. But then another opportunity came up. And as you look back, that was more important than actually making that team. You see, we hear that saying all the time, no pain, no gain. And we say we believe it. But the truth is, I mean, be real. We don't live like it. We don't really want pain. I mean, I don't want pain. I mean, if you want it, I mean, you're different. I mean, for example, I take one of these every day. This is this Ester C 24 hour immune vitamin C. I've been told, you know, if you take this, it builds up your immune system. And then because I'm smart, my wife recommended this. I'm taking this nat nature made vitamin D every day because two years ago, I got one of those summer colds and I took it with me on my mission trip to South Africa. I don't want to do that again. And then last summer, the end of August, I got another summer cold and I got over it. It came back and then I had it for like three weeks. And since I never want to have another summer cold again, I'm taking my vitamins. We do the same with our kids. You know, they got to wear shin guards when they play soccer, right? Now I, I highly recommend shin guards. But in 11th grade, I was wearing shin guards better than these. I still broke my leg. I missed my whole senior year of soccer in spite of the shin guards. These, these things weren't even invented when I was riding bicycle back in the 70s. This bike helmet, we, we put these in our kids' heads. Yes, they ought to wear a bike helmet. How much do they protect? I hope a lot. We, no matter what we do, to avoid pain. The sad truth is this, the hard truth is this, you can't avoid it because God has ordained for you to suffer. Did you know that? 
Already, this is your least favorite sermon from Pastor Guy this summer. But this is the where it is. This is where the rubber meets the road. God has ordained for you and I to suffer. The question is this. How are we to view our sufferings? Now, last week, we began this new series I've titled All Things Good. We looked at Romans 8, 1, how there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Now we come to my second favorite verse in the chapter, Romans 8, 18. Because this is so important. I want all of you guys who are watching, if you can or able, push away that coffee table, you know, get out of your, you know, laying down the couch. I want you to stand up with me. You can look on the screen and let's read aloud. Romans 8, 18. Do you think you can do it? You think you can do it? All right, let's go ahead. Romans 8, 18. The Apostle Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. How was that for you? Let's just say a short prayer. Dear God, this is going to be a hard one, Lord. Would you show us how you can use sufferings for our good and not to harm us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, there's two key words in this verse. He begins with, I consider. I, shortest word in the, in the dictionary. It begins with I, it begins with me, it begins with you. Now, if you were going to get through the sufferings in this life and, and triumph in the midst of them, it begins with you. What I mean by that is you are going to have to make your faith your own. It can't be your mom's faith. It can't be your dad's faith. It can't be your grandmother's faith. It can't be your youth pastor's faith. It can't be your pastor's faith. It, it, it can't be your older sibling's faith. You have got to, at some point, draw that line in the sand and make your faith your own. So let's start. Let's pick on the teenagers, 13 to 19. I want to know, you guys, I'm not asking, have you been baptized? I'm not asking if you prayed the sinner's prayer at day camp, asking Jesus in your life. I'm not asking if you go to youth group. We've got a great youth group. I'm not asking if you've even been on a mission trip. I'm asking you right now. Are you sure that you have made your faith your own? Well, let's pick on the adults. Let's say over 40, 50, 60. You know, some of you have been churched your whole life. I don't care about that. What I'm asking you guys right now is are you sure that you have surrendered completely your life to Jesus Christ, however old you are. And then let's come back to the younger people, 20s, early 20s into 30s. And this is what I believe. As you're headed into your late 20s, if you haven't yet made Jesus your own, the odds are you are not ever going to make Jesus your own. So I want to know, as you're about to hit, hit suffering in your life, there is no way the rest of the sermon is going to make sense until you first come fully and completely to Jesus Christ. Word number two is consider. Paul says, I consider. Consider means to reckon, to contemplate, to reflect this means that we, at some point, we are going to have to think deeply. You're going to have to turn off your cell phone. You're going to have to push away the television. You're going to have to get off Facebook. You're going to have to get away from a lot of things. You may have to go on a hike. You may need to take a weekend away by yourself. You need to get on your knees before God with the open Bible. You have to consider now. You're going to have to take a deep thought and think about your present suffering. You need to own your attitude. You are responsible for how you view your sufferings. No one else. You bring your attitude with you. So what are you considering is true? And we have to realize that we have to understand that God knows things that we don't know. A number of years ago, I came across this little book called Behind a Frowning Providence by John Murray. It's an excellent book. There's so much in it, just 30 pages. So much is here. But he begins by defining the word providence, made up of two Latin words, uh, video, to see, and pra, before. It means beforehand. 
God sees beforehand. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. God knows what's going to happen to you next year. God knows who, what's going to happen to our country. And God has is providentially in control of all things. And this book actually talks about what he calls dark providences, frowning providences. You've got to read the book to, to really get it. It appears sometimes that God is against us, but we know he's always for us. He has a plan. Page 10 talks about God's secret plan. I'll get into much more of that next week when we look at Romans 8.28. But we have to consider that God has ordained things. We are part of his plan. It's a secret plan. And could it be that he's using our sufferings as part of his plan? Now, let's talk about the is And then we'll talk about the will be. First, the is. Our present sufferings. Our means that these aren't unique to you and me. Every now and then people say, oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. No, no. People all over the world suffer. If you don't know that, you know, go visit some countries. Go to India. Go to other countries. People suffer all over the world. And and Paul, the apostle, even said in 2 Timothy 3.12, he said... Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone. Present sufferings. What's need is last week, if you're with us last week, I talked about that there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. That we are set free from the wrath of God. We are forgiven of our sins. And that means when we die, we have eternal life. We will never, ever suffer for a second beyond the grave if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. But in this life, while we are in this earth suit, this present life, we will suffer. Sufferings, afflictions, trials, and tribulations. Why? Why? Well, I got to go to the glasses for this one. Page 15 of this little booklet, he gives four or five reasons why. I'm just going to focus on two of them. One is he says that sufferings are to expose our sins. He says, when we set off on the Christian pathway, We do not know much about our true selves. It's even possible to enter the Christian ministry without much knowledge of the deceitfulness of the heart. Dr. Lloyd-Jones says, we are on two good terms with ourselves. He goes on to say this. Sufferings teach us lessons that we cannot learn in college. We may have been to college or seminary and have a string of letters after our name. We may have read all the great classics in theology and be able to argue on the finer points of divinity, and yet our knowledge may be largely theoretical. It is one thing to know about God. It is another thing to know God. And the great reformer 500 years ago, Martin Luther, once said, Affliction is the Christian's theologian. I never knew the meaning of God's word until I came into affliction, my temptations, My trials have been my masters in divinity. You see, there is no way that we will fully understand and know God without these sufferings. Now, as Paul the Apostle penned this letter of Romans, I did my research. Well, you know, do you know Romans was written in 57 AD? Paul had been a Christian some 20 years. But two years before he wrote the book of 2 Corinthians, I want to read for you some of the sufferings Paul said he experienced in the book of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11, verse 24, Paul writes, Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. Do you think he was in danger? I have 
labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I have been cold and naked beside everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul was stoned on numerous occasions. Most of us have not and ever will go through the kind of suffering he went through. And yet he writes Romans 8, 18. I consider that these present sufferings, we'll get to the will be in a second. These present sufferings, why do they happen? What is the purpose? And in the next chapter, he says this, chapter 12, verse 7. After he talks about how he experienced heaven, many believe that he was stoned and died at one point, and he, he went to heaven and he came back. He saw the amazing beauty of heaven. Verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12 says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. And three times I pleaded with the Lord, to remove it, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in your weakness. Paul is saying there that to keep me from becoming conceited, God allowed this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, to torment him and refuse to take it away. Because God said, my grace is sufficient for you. I mean, is it possible? I know you probably think it's not that if you never suffered, we just become these overly conceited, proud, obnoxious, arrogant people? I think it is. If, if God always was like a genie in a bottle and, and gave us everything we asked for and never said no, and, and we succeeded at everything, we would have the biggest heads in the world and we would be so far from God because God says he's opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It is our sufferings that brings us to be more and more like Jesus Christ. Now, I realize it's one thing to say that. It's another thing to truly understand it. I came across a story a few years ago. Dr. Peter Kreft, who is a professor of philosophy at Boston College and the King's College. And he gives a hypothetical story about a bear. He says, imagine that a bear is caught in a trap and a hunter comes along and out of empathy wants to liberate the bear from this trap. And at first he tries to win over the bear's confidence, but of course that doesn't work. And so the only thing he can do then is he shoots the bear with drugs. And as he's doing that, the bear is convinced that this man is attacking him and trying to kill him, not realizing that the man is doing this out of compassion. But then to really free him from the trap. The hunter knows what he has to do is he has to push the bear farther into the trap so he can release the tension on the spring. And if the bear were semi-conscious at this point, the bear would be convinced that the hunter was his enemy and, and trying to cause his suffering. But the truth is that would not be the case at all. That the hunter it's merely wanting to save the bear. But the bear, because he's a bear and not a human being, doesn't understand. Could it be because we're human beings and not God that we just don't understand? We aren't the God of providence. He sees beforehand. Could it be that God is doing something good when it feels to us like he's doing something that's so bad? So, God is always at work. We have to understand that. And you know, I know it's a lot easier to say this than to practice this. A few days ago, I met with two young men. Uh, one boy is 19, one 17, and they asked to meet with me because their friend, who was their age, had just died in an accident couple weeks ago and they were hurting they were grieving and the older brother as I was talking to him he asked me pointedly the question he asked me so do you ever doubt and you know I wish I would have prefaced it by saying 
If you mean disbelieve, no, I don't disbelieve. But what I said, and I will still say, I said, yes, I do. I have at times doubted. I probably will again. I've doubted in times of grief and hardship, and I might doubt again. You know what? We somehow think it's the spiritual answer to say, no, I never doubt. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good, and God is good all the time. But that doesn't mean life is easy, and life is hard, and grief plays games with your mind, and sometimes... We do doubt. Sometimes we do doubt. You know, um, you know, I think it's a bad rap. Doubting Thomas. Poor guy. You know, the Bible never calls him Doubting Thomas. It's Christians later that call him Doubty Thomas. I think like on two occasions, he voiced his doubt. The difference between Doubting Thomas and the 10 other guys is they kept their mouths shut while they doubted. And he opened them up because he was honest and transparent and asked the question. They were afraid to ask Jesus the question. But we know when the women came and reported to the disciples that he was risen, they all said it was nonsense because they doubted. Now, Thomas wasn't alone in doubt. He just expressed his doubt. Did you know Thomas went on to be a missionary? Tradition says he went to India, and there he died a martyr's death, being speared to death. Oh, Thomas never denied his Lord. He had some doubt. At Mountain View, if you regularly attend or if you're watching it for the first time, you can know this. You can doubt. You are allowed to doubt. Oh, I want you to believe. I want you to believe that this Bible is true from beginning to end because I believe it is and Jesus died for your sins. He rose from the grave and there's evidence to prove that. But it is okay to doubt. This is a safe place for you. We are a family. We are not judgmental. We extend our grace and truth to you because we are all in this human life together and we all need one another. In your doubt and your struggle, just come back to this book. Come back to God's word and then believe. Well, we've talked about what is our present sufferings. Now let's finish the verse with what will be. Verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The glory that will be revealed in us. The glory, it's a word that's hard to define. God is awesome. God is majestic. God is almighty. God is so pure and holy and awesome. And no man can see God and live. Not in this earthly body. Not in all of his glory. But what Paul is saying here is that there is coming a time when we will be revealed and his glory will be revealed in us that we will see him as he is either at our death or at Jesus return when he comes back to this earth. But at one of those two places, if, 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 if you are a Christian have called on Jesus name, his glory will be revealed in you and you will see him as he is and you will be changed. You will be totally different. You will never doubt or struggle or sin. You'll be in all your glory and it will be so amazing that you'll look back and say, I can't believe I ever, ever questioned the goodness of God because look at what he has for me. It's going to be so very awesome. And yet, Paul tells us that it's hard, but in your hard time, know that God is like the grand weaver. We'll look at that next week. And he has a plan. He's working all things out for good for you. So be patient and wait and look ahead because he has something awesome in store for you. Well, I've got here a short little rope for you. And what I've done with this white rope is I'm an artist. I mean, look at, look at me, you know. No, I'm not that artistic. But I've, I put some blue tape 
I, I went into our storage room and stole a little tape from Dennis Shaw's, you know, room here. And this blue section represents the length of your life. I'm 59 now. Don't know how far along I'm on this. Let's say you live to be 80 or 90 years. The red strips I put in to represent maybe those times in your life where you suffered the most. Could have been as a teenager, could have been middle age, and here, even at the end of your life. And you know, when you go through those red periods of time, the blue times, it's awesome. Life is good. Your kid hit a home run, or you hit a home run, or you got the girl, or you got the guy, or whatever, whatever, whatever. And those red times, when you were stressed, and you were worried, and you are doubted, and you were depressed, and you were hurt, and you were in pain, when life was hard, and Paul says, I consider that our present suffering is not worth to be compared with the glory that is revealed in us. That we don't take a scissors and we cut off our life and you're six feet under and it's over. No, your life, if you know Jesus Christ, your eternal life just begins at your physical death. But it continues on and on and on. And it gets better and it gets better and it gets better, and you meet God more, and you, you learn more of him, and you, he, he reminds you and shows you how awesome he is, and your life goes on and on, and you don't realize that our life is so short. Your sufferings are so short. It seems like it's taking a long time, but you've got 80, 90 years to live, and then you've got 200 years in glory. You've got 500 years in glory. You've got 1,000 years in glory. You got 1,500 years in glory. You've got 2,000 years in glory, and you're just starting out. You're at year 2,000, and you just got there. You got 2,500 years. You got 3,000 years. You've got 4,000 years. You've got 5,000 years. You've got 8,000 years. Man, you've got 10,000 years, and you're there forever. 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 And you realize the Lord is so amazing. And you realize I consider that my present sufferings are not worth to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Amen. It is awesome. We just have to believe that he knows what he is doing. So Romans 8.18, what a great verse. What a totally awesome and great verse. And for those of you that maybe you got some bad news this week or this month for yourself or a friend or a loved one, as long as you know Jesus, I want you to believe that God is for you and he's not against you. He cares for you and he loves you. I want to close with a story. Pastor Gavin Reed, a number of years ago, tells a story of a boy in his congregation who, at the age of one, fell down a flight of stairs and shattered his back. And when he was a teenager, he interviewed him in his church. And in the interview, the boy made the remark that God is fair. And, and the pastor just found that interesting. And so he I did a fault. He said to the boy, so how old are you now? And the boy said, I'm 17. And the pastor asked, and how many years have you spent in the hospital? And he said, 13 years. And Pastor Reed said, and do you think that is fair? And the boy replied, God's got all of eternity to make it up to me. God has all of eternity to make it up to you and to me. And he gave his son Jesus for you and he died for you and he rose for you and he's already done everything for you. And yet he allows hard times. 
He allows illness and disease and hardship and pain and conflict. He allows hurt. He allows death. He allows suffering. But he is a good God. Today, in your doubt, still believe. Because he is for you. He's not against you. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worth to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Would you pray with me? Lord God, would you today just assure us that you're there, that you are not silent, that you have spoken, that you have a perfect plan for each and every one of us, and that we can just trust you today. And Father, for the one person who's watching who doesn't know you yet, may they say, Jesus, I want to make my faith my own today. Jesus, would you come in my life? I am surrendering my life to you. Just tell them, Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. I want to draw a line in the sand. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Save me. I commit to follow you. Oh, God, we love you. We praise you. And for the person out there suffering today, may he or she know that you have their back and you will make things up to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hi everyone, Matt and I didn't discuss our wardrobe before filming this, so nice shirt, Matt. But I wanted to take an opportunity to share with you my church, some news on my health. During a routine MRI in mid-June, the doctors found a growth on my liver, and after further tests and a biopsy, they determined that, it was, that that growth was cancerous. So over the past month, I have had many scans, um, procedures to identify and, de and develop a treatment plan for this cancer. There are still some uncertainties at the moment, but I should have some of those uncertainties clarified in the next couple of days. And, and I hope to begin chemotherapy next week, actually this week coming up. Um, so this is not the news that a pastor wants to share with his church. Um, it is very fitting that Pastor Guy is, is preaching through Romans 8. Romans 8 is my, my favorite passage from Scripture. Um, next week, um, Pastor Guy will be focusing on Romans 8.28, and it says that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And so I fully believe that God is working this for good, and I am trusting in His promises in his providence, in the fact that he is working good in my life, in my family's life, and in the life of Mountain View Community Church. 
Um, Paul goes on in verse 29 to share what that good is that he's doing. And he says that the good that he's performing in verse 28 is us becoming conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And it's my prayer that as I go through this difficult time, that God will um, be forming me more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Um, That's my prayer for you as well. Um, If you're willing to to pray for me during this time, um, please pray that God will either use the doctors at John Hopkins in medical means or his direct hand to to heal me um, and provide healing during this time. Um, Also, please pray for my wife, Sri, and my sons to find their strength and their comfort in the Lord during this difficult time. Um, And finally, pray that while I focus on healing and and recovery, that I might find new ways to minister, minister to you, minister to to the church, um, and also just see God use this story to unfold his glory. Um, I want more than anything to see him glorified in me, in my family, and in my journey. Um, So if you would like to stay updated on my health, you can visit a blog that I, I, I started called uncommonfamily.org or check out my Facebook page as I will be posting updates regularly. So if we're not friends on Facebook, please um, check in with me, friend me so that we can stay in touch. So um, I love you. I appreciate your prayers and your support um, during this time. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for joining us today for online worship and uh, love to take the opportunity to close our services in prayer, but also to be able to pray for Pastor Adam and Shree and the boys uh, during this time. So would you please join me in prayer and and you can even extend your hands right where you are as we pray for Adam and, and his family. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the truth of what we heard today from Romans chapter eight, verses 18 and just the, the reality of the glory that we have to look forward to in the midst of our present sufferings. Father, I'm thankful for Pastor Adam and just uh, so thankful for the work that he has done here for the gospel in Frederick at Mountain View Community Church. And uh, Lord, we just wanna pray for him. Father, we lift him up to you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would fill him, uh, give him strength, give him stamina, Lord, give him um, just clarity of mind and wisdom as there's decisions that they'll have to make Uh, in the days and weeks ahead. I pray, Father, also for Shri, Lord, that you would encourage her, that you would strengthen her, that you would surround her, Father, with with people that would uh, lift her up and encourage her. And for the boys as well, Lord, we're just so thankful for them and uh, just their love for you and for each other. And we pray that you would protect them, provide for them, Lord, uh, give this family a sense of your presence, your peace during this time. Father, most of all, I wanna pray in Jesus' name that you would heal Adam. Father, we ask uh, that your kingdom would come and that you would touch his body, Father, that you would heal him, whether that be a a miraculous healing that we know you're able to do, Father, or through the treatments, Father, through the, uh, the chemo, through all the things that will be coming to pass, Lord, that you would heal Adam and strengthen him and lift him up for your glory, for your service, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today.